Let me ask you a question. Is the law spiritual? Yeah. Okay. So if the law is spiritual and we're walking in the spirit, how are we walking? Well, yeah, we're walking in the moral aspect of the law because... Well, where, where does it say moral, though? Well, because I look to Galatians 5, I, I look to Scripture for my answers. It says, Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the spirit, which is the spirit, spiritual, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. I would ask the gentleman, I know that you uh, probably have a love for bacon, and I'm okay with that, but the Father showed me different. If, if the Father said in the beginning of his words, these are the very words spoken by Yodi Vave, that he's given clean and unclean animals, what gives us the understanding that we can start eating something that's unclean? And if we're eating something unclean, I would submit to you that if you are the temple, and you put something unclean, like a pig on the temple, do you realize what you're doing? Well, and then now you're contradicting what Jesus Christ said, because he said it's not what goes in the mouth of a man or in his stomach that defiles him because it cannot touch his heart. Can, can we look at that? Was That's Matthew 15, right? And I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, oh, it's still talking about that. It's talking about hand washing. Yeah, But I already know about that. I, mean, I was in your exact position. But that's what it's talking about. It's talking about the ordinances of men. Again, I know it was. But look at the way that Jesus worded it. It's very easy to understand exactly what he's talking about. I mean, listen to what he's saying. Nothing yeah, that goes in your stomach can defile you. It's what comes out through right, your so heart, it, through your mouth when you're speaking. So if I eat a piece of bacon, it comes out as waste. It does not defile me. It does not make me unclean. Then what do we do about Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66 when Yahweh himself says he's going to destroy those who have swine's flesh in their cooking pot? Well, and I've studied that, and a lot of the whole issue with that is you got to really read that whole chapter in context. There's some very deep occultic rituals that is going on in that chapter. You can't just cherry pick and lift that one little verse out and say, oh, look, swine, you know, he's talking about flesh here, having swine's flesh and the flesh of mice. It's also talking about, you know, different activities going on in, the, in this garden and behind the trees. You have to just look at the whole thing in context, and I'm sure Afshin would agree with me on that. Absolutely. I mean, we've talked about this in other shows on, on this topic, but First Timothy 4.4. For every creature of God is good. Every Again, every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Let, and then Colossians 2.16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day. The Sabbath was a holy day, by the way. Or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body of his, is of Christ. So we've gone over this issue in, in previous shows you know, there's a vision given unto Peter where Jesus said, you know, eat all these all these animals that were former, formerly unclean, he said to eat. Now, I understand that ultimately the spiritual application of that was that now the Gentiles were clean by the blood of Jesus and the gospel was going to be preached unto all nations. That's the primary spiritual application. But the Bible and Jesus and God, they don't ever use something literal and and to describe something spiritual unless that literal thing is true also okay so if he says all the animals are clean you can now rise arise and eat well he means it you know i had bacon this morning i it's perfectly fine um there's nothing wrong with it and that's where we're we are under the law of liberty and it goes back to that issue of god has written the new covenant in our hearts and it's not in my heart to get, you know, to follow those, the carnal laws, but it is in my heart not to, to hate or not to, you know, sin and to lust or to whatever else, because those things are still in my heart, you know, so it's very simple. I don't know where the confusion is on your part here. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not confused. I just believe every word, um, because when he, he, he stated there's unclean animals, the father loves you. He wants you to, to have good things in your body. 
I'm going to submit to you that pork is horrible. Um, I, I'm a cook, actually, and I know trigonosis. You can't get that out of pork. So what you're, you can go all online and see this. And the Father says, if you destroy, if you continue destroying the temple, which if your temple is, is of the Holy Spirit, is your body, he's going to destroy those people. I mean, I, I, I don't know where that is, is hard to understand. You say you believe every word of God, so why don't, why don't you believe that what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common? If you, you know, if, because here's the problem. If we say that Jesus came and changed anything in the law, this is why the Jews don't believe. And you know what the prophecy is? Salvation's to the Jew first. So here's the problem. If you and other people are telling Jews that it's okay to eat pork, do you know that they will never, ever accept Yeshua? And that is the reason why they don't. So the problem that you're going to run into, and it's very serious, is for a Christian to say, oh, those Jews, they're not saved, they don't have Jesus. Woo! You are going to get broken off, my friend, because what happens is by the righteousness of, of, of Yah, which is his Torah, is righteous. And it even says in, in, in uh, 1 John uh, 2, 7, I believe, um, I'll, I'll get the scripture. He says, do righteousness that which Jesus did righteousness. So you're saying Christ rejecting Jews are saved? What's that? I, somehow you'd love to put things in my mouth. I never said that. If you well, have a Jew, huh? I said that sounds like what you just said. No, well, let me, and I apologize if if it sounded like that. A Jew who reads the Torah, the prophecy is that Judah, remember, because they're the Jew, a Jew, Judah will see. Jesus, you know how they're going to see him? Because they're going to get jealous of the house of Israel because they are going to be doing the same things that they're doing. And they're going to say, well, why are you holding Shabbat? And it's happening all over the world. The instructions of Yahweh is clear. He wants you to get to know him. By the, by the, by the Torah will show us our sin. So once we know that it's not good to eat unclean and the Jews know that, they know that. To insult a Jew like that would be, in other words, they knew back then when Jesus was walking around with the apostles, even Peter said in Acts 10, he said 33 years later, by the way, is when it was, he said, but Lord, I've never put anything unclean to my lips. So Jesus told Peter to go ahead and eat. Did, did you not read the rest of that passage? He just, he just stopped at, I've never put anything unclean in my mouth? Yeah, and why would he do that? Because now the food, all animals are clean. So you're saying that Yahweh, may, Yahweh, which is Yeshua in the flesh, uh, Yeshua is Yahweh in the flesh, you're saying that Yahweh makes a very strong commandment, and his words don't change, Malachi, we understand that, right? His words don't change. But if you're saying his words change, then you're changing the Father's words. So if Yeshua, who is Yahweh in the flesh, came to change anything in the Torah, he is by the Torah a false prophet. Yeah, you're not understanding the foreshadowing of, of those things, you know, because Hebrews 7, 12 says, for the priesthood being changed, it is changed. There is made of necessity a change also of the law. So I don't know about, about Yeshua or Yahweh, but I know that Jesus changed certain aspects of the law and Jehovah changed certain aspects of the law. Uh, Jesus being the begotten of uh, uh, being Jehovah begotten. Um, so it's just a matter of the, those Old Testament, Old Covenant laws foreshadowed. Those That unclean food represented the Gentiles in the Old Covenant. Okay, it was a symbol. It was a shadow of things to come. And so you had to join the nation of Israel in order to, to be circumcised, in order to, you know, come into faith. You had to do certain things. Salvation was always by grace, okay? But... It was there was a nationality that they had to you know the, the gospel was to the Jews at first so um, and once they rejected him then it was opened unto all nations and the, and the gospel was preached unto all nations and it says there's neither Jew nor Greek now there's neither Gentile or Jew so yeah there was a change in the things that foreshadowed Christ it's not that the word contradicts itself is that Jesus fulfilled the carnal laws. 
So if you don't understand that, you're going to see contradictions that aren't there. No, I, I mean, I just want to bring all the scriptures. Remember when uh, he talks to uh, the, the, the Pharisees, and the Pharisees is like, well, where are you going? He said, where I'm going, you can't go. And he's like, and then they're talking amongst themselves. He's like, well, is he going to the Greeks? Is he going to the dysportia? So what is the dysportia? Paul's ministry was to go directly to the people that were out of covenant to bring them back in. This is what the father is doing and right now. He's doing Paul, everything. Paul was going to the Gentiles uh, to preach. Peter was going to the Jews. That was the, the ministry committed unto them. Now they could both preach to either, but it's just that Paul's focus was to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. That, if you don't believe that, you contradict scripture because it directly says that the, that the gospel of you know the Gentiles was committed unto me. So you don't believe that there's Israelite Gentiles? No, of course not. A Gentile is a non-Israelite, is a non-Jew. Well, well, that's not true. That, that's so that, not true. Because if that's true, then the complete understanding of actually Genesis to Revelations is completely, it can't be the gospel because the gospel is the 10, which is the house of Israel. That's the house of Israel. Those are not Jews. And Judah. And the two are going to come back together as one. And anybody who wants to join in that covenant must do the same thing. It's all about do. It's about do. You've been told in the churches it's about a Gentile is a non-Jew or non-Israelite. It's the Greeks. It's the Romans. It's the you know the the uh, Philistines. It's anybody who who wasn't a Jew. You know, it's the pagans, basically the heathen. Those are the Gentiles, and the gospel was opened unto them to believe in Jesus and you know to be grafted in. I don't disagree about being grafted in. But so you think in Ephesus, a hundred thousand people came that were pagans, and they didn't even like the Jews. So Paul stands up, he's like, hey, listen, we got this Jewish rabbi here, just follow him and you'll be okay. I mean, they didn't even like the Jews. Why would they do that? I don't know, why did I follow Jesus? I'm not a Jew, not physically. Uh, but, say, uh, he also did not tell them to, you know, you got to keep the Torah now. I do a video on this, and this is determining what the commands are. And this is in Revelations 12, 17, and Revelations 14, 12. These are the patients of the saints that have the commands of, of Jesus and also have the testimony, or excuse me, uh, that follow the commands and have the testimony of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is the feast days. And so when we look at where it says that not everybody knows the times, the dates, and the seasons, the seasons, well, you and I think of spring, summer, winter, and fall. But in the Hebrew, it's not. It's Moedim. And Moedim means feast days. So we will know, okay, so the church says, well, nobody knows the time, the hour, the day. This is true. But do we know when it's coming back? We do. His imminent return, it can't be tomorrow. It is on the Feast of Nam Torah, which is the Feast of Trumpets. And guess what? Those who are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, on those days will not enter into the final wedding supper of the Lamb. And the wedding supper of the Lamb is the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, I'm going to ask you a simple question, and I just want to get a simple answer. What are the commands of Christ? His commands are to love Yorivave and to love your neighbor. That was taken out of the Torah, and that is a Jewish teaching. And that is two things that hang on all the law and the prophets. When something hangs on something, that means every command is either in this one or in this one. And I can prove this by saying to you this way. Is it okay to be in bestiality? Of course not. Right. But do we see that in the Ten Commandments? Um, that falls under lust. It falls under what? I'm sorry? Lust. Lust. Uh, where is that in the Ten Commandments, lust? Uh, Jesus says that if any man have lust in his heart, he's committed to sin. And Paul said, I had not known lust, except the law said, thou shalt not covet. So certainly we're not thinking that we just want to follow the spiritual. We want to also do the physical, right? 
but we don't, we can't Jesus. And you said several times, do we believe all the, the scripture? Yes, we do. And Jesus says, we can't keep the law. No man has. No man can. But believe in, in, in the Hebrew is aman. See, you have to realize and you have to understand that these words that were used are not, are not, uh, they're not good. Believe, so when we say from a believe, a Western mindset, oh, I believe something. I believe it. Didn't James say even the demons believe and you do well, they shudder? So they believe. They know there's That's a Jesus. The same thing. Oh, uh, sure. Biblical, biblical believing is being fully persuaded. I agree that the devil has tricked people with those kind of words, like believe. Well, I believe so. Well, that's not being fully persuaded. Being fully persuaded is faith, and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So when a person submits himself to the truth of Scripture and listens to it, the Scripture produces faith and fully persuades them. That's why, you know, a, a person that's truly saved knows they're saved and, and, it, and, and they can't waver because they've been fully persuaded. Either what God says is true or it's not. So when he says there's none righteous, no, not one, you would have to agree that you don't keep the law. I don't keep the law. Nobody we know keeps the law. Anybody in the scriptures, none of them kept the law except one, and that was Christ. And he kept the law for us. And so by faith, when we believe the gospel that he died and, and paid our sin debt, rose again for our justification, took his blood, put it on the mercy seat, we believe that what he did, God counts us like we've kept every single law and, and not broke one of them. And that's, that's the law of liberty. We're imputed righteousness. We don't have righteous. We had to be made righteous because we can't earn righteousness. We can't be righteous by keeping the law or trying to keep the Torah. But I'm counted righteous in my substitute, Christ. So I have a question. If the law is, if it's holy, if it's just, if it's good, all the things that David talked about in the Psalms, right? If it's all of that, how can it be death? Because that's what it says in Romans chapter 7. He says, that, I agree. I, I can't, I'm trying to go from memory because my the tablet died and I don't have the uh, actual Bible in front of me. But he said, I found that the commandment is just and the law is good, but he consented that it wrought death in me and it caused sin to appear exceedingly sinful. I can't remember exactly what verse, I think it's around verse eight, if I, if I recall correctly, but uh, it might be a little bit further, but um, it, it says the law may it cause sin to appear exceedingly sinful. The law's purpose in Romans three nineteen is for us to shut our mouths and become guilty before God. We can't say, oh, I'm, I'm righteous because look what I've done. The law shows us. The, the, I use this il illustration. The law is a mirror. You know, if I if I come in from, you know, working outside, I got dirt all over me, and I walk in front of the mirror and look at it, I'm not going to start wiping my face on the mirror to try to get clean. The, 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 it has no power to clean me. It just reveals the dirt, and that's exactly what the law is. The law reveals that we fall short. We come short of the glory of God. We all have sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. I had not known sin except the law said thou shalt, or I had not known lust. I quoted that earlier. It's in the same passage in Romans 7, except the law said thou shalt not covet. So when we read what the law says, it shows us, uh-oh, we have come short. That's why we needed a Savior. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. But after that, we're, we come to Christ. We're no longer under a schoolmaster because it's done its work. The law's work is to produce death in us for us to lay hold on the refuge set before us in Hebrews 6, which is Christ. 
which entereth into the veil. And, and so he is our anchor, both sure and steadfast. And, and I'm trying to quote it, probably quoting it backwards. <laughs> That's pretty good, Daniel, for not having a Bible in front of you. Um, Romans 3.20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. So how do you, why do you think you're justified in his sight? By following the law. And, and again, if I can answer that very simply, it's not talking about the Torah. It's talking about Paul is talking to people who are, who are being subverted into Judaism. Understand, this is not Judaism, okay? Okay, but again, you're interjecting your own private interpretation into the clear words of Scripture. No, it says law. It says nomos in the Greek. It doesn't say anything else. So okay. you have to be a Berean and understand what law he's talking about. There's the law of sin and death. There's the law of, of the oral law. There's the, the, the Torah. There's many different laws, and the problem is... And if you start to understand the Hebrew, there's no Greek word that means that law. It's you don't even understand the Hebrew. I mean, you're talking about, but you, you don't speak a word of Hebrew, do you? I don't need to. I do look into it, and I do study it. I do. So the problem is, is it, and, and here's, your, here's going to be the problem. If what I said is true, then you've got a very big problem with your whole doctrine because this is what the Father showed me clearly. This is the very scriptures that people use and, and they twist Paul. So this is fulfilling 2 Peter 3, 15, 19. There are going to be people that are twisting Paul's words who are, and again, I'm not saying it, he says it, unlearn because they don't study Paul. Paul. Okay, so likewise, if what you're saying is right, you're in a heap of trouble. And let's let's look at Romans 3, you know, because you're saying Romans 3.20 is not talking about the law of God. It's talking about the oral law or something ridiculous. But so Romans 3, if you just back up to Romans 3.19, now we know that what, so, that what things soever the law saith, it says to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So this is saying, it's very clear, it's talking about the law of Moses, you know, the law of God given through Moses, because it's that's the law by which all the world will become guilty before God. That's the law that gives us the knowledge of sin. You're saying that's something else? Just randomly? Because your lexicon says so? I mean, it's ridiculous. And also, you have to say that that verse that Paul did mention, you're a debtor to do the whole law. So, you know, how can you take it upon yourself to determine which laws the, those are? If it says the whole law, is well fortunately that only means the whole law of the torah I, I i think that's just an easy way to try to justify trying to keep the law for on a workspace salvation. salvation well and also it adds in that doug what you what you don't understand is that god requires perfection like perfection you can't have one sin if you've committed one, you're guilty of them all. And it's not even just the one since you became saved or on the road to seeking truth, whatever. From the moment you became a man, every single sin that you have done, uh, even when you were ignoring God, those all have to be accounted for. And you're, it's what your judgment's going to look like at every single moment of your adult life, you're going to be judged for each one of those sins that you've committed. And it doesn't matter if you've done a lot of good in there. If you've committed one, if you're not perfect, you will not enter into eternal life. But in fact, I mean, if you die in that, Fashion, you're not going to the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to go to the uh, great white throne judgment. And that's that's different. 
but you will be judged by your works just like you want to be just like you're preaching that we need to be focused on our works um and so you will get exactly what you want you know like if you want to be judged by the law uh that's exactly what god's going to judge all the people who are in unbelief by uh the only way to get past um this life alive is have the sinless imputed perfection of jesus christ accounted to your to your account uh, credited to your account by your faith alone period if you don't have his sinless perfection that's the only thing that that god's going to look at he's not going to look at what you did after your sinless or after you believed on him when it comes to your standing now there's a hierarchy in heaven there's a reason why we do works there's we want to please him there's a reason why we don't sin we don't want to get chastised you know there's it's there's more to it it's pretty dynamic but those are two different things that's somebody who's already a saint who's already eternally secure and that's another issue that 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 you have at least you understand that jesus is god uh whatever you want to say his name is um you do understand that and you do believe that that's one essential so that's good we can come together on that but you don't believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. You do believe that works are necessary. You do believe that uh, um, I, I even think that there's, that there's something in your theology that has the Jews because of their genealogy, that they have some special uh, uh, privilege more than just the oracles. Um, but you do believe in, in that you've got to do something, whether it's keeping the law or not sinning anymore. Or you said, you said a couple of things tonight that, that made that clear. Um, but I also don't believe that you believe in eternal life is given to those who are saved, who are children of God. Um, I, I like when I re received his spirit, I became born again. And at that moment, I received eternal life. I will never perish nor come into condemnation. I am fully resting. I have ceased from my own works and I have entered into his rest. Um, and so what it from our conversation it seems like two of the three essential there's only three essentials of the faith um that i have been able to discern that are throughout the whole bible but when it comes down to it two of the three you are pretty much downright rejecting you are saying no jesus isn't the only way you've got to do your works and two you don't have eternal life until the very end where I believe eternal life is is received in the here and now. Today is the day of salvation. When um, the rich ruler is talking and he's saying, um, uh, what do I have to do to achieve eternal life? And that he wants to see the kingdom. Uh, this is a, a kind of like an idiom. And when you see the kingdom, actually my wife got a word about this that one is able to see the kingdom when they can see the Torah. Because what the Torah does is it shows the heart of the Father. And the Father shows the person, see, nobody can just come to Jesus. And th this is completely unscriptural. The Father must draw them to the Son, and then the Son shows them the Father. That's scriptural. And the problem is, when I, and I'm just going to submit to you, and I don't want to come across rude. This is what the scriptures say, that if, 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 if the person doesn't understand, and Paul talks about this, and the Christians take it and twist it. 
there's a veil on their hearts, even when Moses is read to this day. Well, that veil is taken off, and then how is that veil taken off? By Messiah. So if the veil is taken off and the context was Moses, why in the world in Malachi 4.4 4, does it say, remember the law of Moses? And actually the word there in the Hebrew is shakar, was a very deep word, and it means to remember, to, to hold a remembrance, to never forget it. And it is in the context of Jesus coming back. If we take a look at just one scripture, just, just right out the gate, 1 John 2.29, how do we, if you know that he is righteous, obviously we know Jesus is righteous, you know that everyone is doing righteousness, has been born of him. And so again, here's this word doing. It's all, I'm going to submit to you, everything that we've been taught in the churches is upside down. Well, I'm just saying, you're saying right there, that it's doing, that the gospel is doing. So you, you well, openly, that's, what John said. Well, that, that, that's fine. I'm just saying you openly admit that, that it is, you're, you believe in a gospel of doing where we believe in a gospel of done. So if that's the case though, why does it say that in John? And, and here's what it says. First John two twenty nine. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone doing righteousness has been born of him. Yeah, but that's that's actually that's talking scripture. about walking. Yeah, that's that's talking about walking in the spirit. Because and, nobody and, can walk in the spirit if they're not regenerated. You don't do the Ten Commandments in order to walk in the spirit. Um, yes, a lot of false converts do that. They they try to, I've got to obey this commandment, this commandment, this commandment, so I can make sure I'm walking in the Spirit. That's not how it works. That's not what children of God do. We are His children when we believe on His name and get washed in the blood, and we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, at this moment, we've got still have free will. Um, we still have the ability to choose or to disobey him or obey him. And really when it comes down to it, what we have the choice to do is either walk in the flesh or walk in the spirit. Now, when we deny our flesh, which we should learn to do daily, we then choose to walk in the spirit and it is him, his fruits, we're the branch, he's the vine. It's his fruits that bear on us, his love, his long suffering, his joy, his peace. Um, so then what happens is the Ten Commandments or the law are actually being followed or being adhered to as a byproduct because God cannot, he can't sin, he can't tell a lie. And when it's God working in and through us, he cannot break the laws. We, we will not give in to us. We will not blaspheme his name. We will not do the things that he tells us not to in the Ten Commandments. So we don't try to follow the Ten Commandments in order to walk in the Spirit. That's doing it in your flesh, and that's not pleasing to God. But only false confidence. Con or false converts can only walk in their flesh. They haven't the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They can't even walk in the Spirit. But as children, what we do is we just walk in the Spirit and then automatically, or as a byproduct, it's not anything by our own will, we are then following the Ten Commandments, every single one of them, not ever breaking a one when we're walking in the Spirit. But that's the problem with most believers is that they don't choose to walk in the spirit as often as they should. Uh, they actually give in to the desires and lusts of the flesh more often than not. But just because a saint walks in the flesh, that doesn't mean they're not a saint. They're already saved. In fact, they could be saved if they're truly a saint fully resting in the in the blood of Christ and you know sit there and uh, uh, eat 
whatever pork they want, blaspheme all they want, or actually most the same person doesn't want to do save do murder, the same murder. person doesn't want to. Right, they could murder. They do all that. Kind of like they could. They 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 could to go to an extreme. They absolutely could. But most people aren't going to get saved and then go and become a murderer or go and become a rapist. But I will submit unto you that the Bible gives us a great example in David who murdered and committed adultery, received the chastisement of having his child taken from him, but yet still he was a child of God the whole time. He actually did many things uh, to bring forth Jesus Christ. And uh, I would say Solomon is even a, a better example of a saint turning wicked and still being in glory. Uh, but, Saul? but Solomon and, and no, Saul, no. Saul, Saul fell on his, yeah, Saul fell on his sword. But I do believe that he also was saved. God chose him to be the king. Um, and he, uh, uh, he, his flesh took, got the better of him. And God took him home early. He let the, uh, he let him and his sons get taken over by the Philistines. Well, let's just not him. forget King David, who committed murder and adultery. Uh, uh, Paul, he murdered many Christians. That does not mean that they are not saved. Well, and I would just, I would just add, Paul, at the time where he was murdering Christians, he wasn't saved. But David... And everybody else that we've mentioned, they these were saved people doing these wicked, hideous acts. Even David, uh, he wasn't a murderer uh, before he got saved, but he fell into the sin of murder and, and adultery. And we know he's saved. He wrote the Psalms, you know, many, many, many of the Psalms. And you know what's really what's really sad about all this, Doug, is that I see you working so hard to try to get saved or to try to know God. And, you know, you're missing it. And I'm, I'm genuinely concerned because I don't want you to burn in hell. And I, I, I do believe that it, you are headed in that direction, not as an insult, but because truly you're, you're relying on your works. You're trying to save yourself by following the law. And so, you know, that's, I'm hoping that you'll wake up and, and see and get saved because Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, you know, I'd love to see how you interpret this verse because it's so clear. For by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And what we're seeing from you is that you're working to keep the law rather than simply trusting in the substitution of Jesus Christ in his shed blood. I'm sure you've got an answer of how you see it, but it's, you know, I'm curious what you'll say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in Ephesians, again, he's talking to people in Ephesus, uh, and he's basically, you know, making a very strong statement, and he's like, I, I want to turn to it real quick because I, I don't want to misquote anything. And these are... Uh, did you ever notice what we're what we're talking about here? All revolves around Paul. I think it revolves around Jesus, who is the Word. But okay. Remember, remember, uh, uh, Paul learned from Jesus. Okay, and so in Ephesians two eight, is that by words that he mentioned boast? I believe that people don't understand that there's a difference between um, redemption and salvation. I don't see, uh, and, and please point it to me if, if you do see it, because, and the context of it is not now. It's There's nowhere where you're going to see salvation eternally. Like like right now, you've been saved right now. Uh, John 5.24 says that. What does it say? Okay, John 5.24. And I'd like to get back to Ephesians because... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. But John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath 
everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So there's very definitive language there. You have everlasting life, half everlasting life is in the present tense and shall not come into condemnation. So it's not saying you won't come into condemnation as long as you keep doing certain things. There's no conditions attached to that at all. And it says you have everlasting life. Everlasting life by definition means forever. It lasts forever. So unless God is a liar, which we know he's not, you know, eight, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, without going into a lot of other verses, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 and John 5, 24, you know, ye are saved. You're saved through faith. Yeah. The, the salvation um, in the uh, Tanakh, the Old Testament, was always Yahweh taking somebody from one place and bringing them to another. And the eternal salvation is going to be taking us from the grave and bringing us into the land. That We're all going to Israel. I hope everybody under, agrees with that. And the whole idea of uh, Acts 15 was how were uh, a, a Gentile convert coming in? To learn the four laws so there you have it uh yahweh showed me this i haven't said this yet but i i'm gonna state to you this is what i would submit to be how somebody comes in the covenant number one you have to count the costs yeshua made it very clear he says uh, jesus made it very clear count the costs before you even get in count the cost so is anybody counting the cost when they're raising a hand in church no what is the counts what is what are we counting the cost for where does because, it say to count the cost can you can you show me that to Before count we cost? Just 10 points of say like where does it say to count the cost yeah. sure it's in Luke 14 28 okay so Luke 14 28 let's just pull that up talking about building a tower and, and counting the cost what's the context of that well it's a parable remember you, Jesus spoke in parables all the time and he sure. said, well, why are you speaking in parables? He's because for those of the those who don't understand, it's not for them. Jesus was very clear. He did not pray for the world. Okay, so here's the context of that passage. is verse 27. It's right there next to what you're reading. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And you go to verse 28, which is what you're reading, without reading verse 27, which is the context. It's talking about discipleship there. It's not talking about salvation. So right off the bat, you have a misconception about salvation versus discipleship. You know, salvation is free. It's a free gift, as Ephesians 2, 8, 9 said. So how do you interpret Ephesians 2, 8 through 9? For by grace are ye saved through faith. Because faith in Hebrew means emunah. Okay, again, going back to Hebrew, you know, faith means faith to me. But yeah, but it's a Greek Western mind thinking that you've been that you. So, that you so God does not have the ability to preserve His word to the Western world. So basically, none of us in the West, in America, in Europe, you know, in Mexico, anywhere, we don't have the word of God. We just have to. We have to rely on the lexicons to get an understanding. Oh, no, it has nothing to do with the lexicons. Do you know right now there are people in China that are reading Torah and understanding, and okay, they've been so called? Unless you read, unless you speak Hebrew and read Hebrew, you can't be, you can't understand God's word. We don't have God's word without that. It just, I mean, uh, I, the whole point, you know, and this is coming from um, Doug, I was in your exact position three years ago. I was doing and teaching the exact same things that you're doing now. I thank Jesus Christ every day that I was taken out of that mindset and I was given my fleshy heart and I was able to read through the power of the Holy Spirit to understand the context of the New Testament. I stopped listening to Jim Staley. I stopped listening to Michael Rood. I stopped listening to these men tell me what I was supposed to be interpreting. I quit reading lexicons. I quit reading all that stuff because it was getting me more and more confused. I see it in you. I know you feel it. And I want you to see the truth in the simplicity of the gospel of Christ. It's very easy to understand. Trying to learn the Hebrew stuff will do nothing but confuse you. Because the Hebrew was a dead language at the time of Christ. 
That's why they had the Septuagint, because not even the Jews could, they didn't even know how to pronounce the ancient Hebrew or Paleo-Hebrew words anymore. So the, the modern Hebrew we have now is just that. It's modern Hebrew. It's not ancient. Nobody knows the phonetics or the pronunciation of a lot of these words. And that is why we're having so many problems right now with this Hebrew roots movement. That's a great word, Kip. And the only thing that came to mind is the question for Doug is, have you ever just gotten a King James Bible and just read through the New Testament, you know, and without the aid of any commentaries and lexicons and Hebrew and Greek and anything else, and even the Old Testament, and just read the whole Bible through and through? Have you ever done that just through the King James? And, you know, because we believe that's a perfect preservation of God's word. Um, there's, there's contradictions in the other versions. And so either the modern versions are right or the King James. They can't both be right because they, they differ. Um, so have you ever done that? I mean, honestly, have you ever read through the whole New Testament without the aid of some teacher, without the aid of, you know, just you and the Holy Spirit in, in the yeah. word? Are, are you aware King James wrote demonology? Okay, that's not what I asked you. No, I'm just, just asking a question because you said that certainly we'd want to know that somebody's that righteous is aware. You're not aware book. Of that either. That's just some blog you read or something. Oh, no, that's true. You can look at that. I don't push an agenda. I'm just asking you if you know that. If, well, you probably read some false thing. And even if he did, the, the, you know, God has the ability to preserve his word throughout, you know, for however he wants. That's not the question. The question is. Have you ever read through the New Testament and the Old in the King James um, just through and through without the aid of some false teacher, without the aid of some Hebrew lexicon, just you and the Holy Ghost on your knees praying before God saying, Lord Jesus, just show me the truth of your scriptures. Have you ever done that? I notice you use the King James Holy Ghost. A ghost is a dead spirit. Why would you ask Again, for that? Avoiding, you're avoiding the question. You're, no, you're I, avoiding I have. the question and you're being circular. Just answer okay. action directly, please. Uh, I absolutely have read the King James. I still read the King James. I read about 10 different uh, uh, parallels of Scripture with my e-sword. So you've never just read the Bible without the aid of any teacher? We're not called to read the Bible. We're called to study the Bible. Okay, study the Bible, aside from, without going to outside sources, just you and the Holy Spirit. You've never done that. And so, Mike, my, my, you know, the problem we're seeing is that you're relying on all these other, you know, outside truths that are, that are not truths, and it's just clouding your judgment. That's all I wanted to say on that. I mean, I, I just hope that instead of relying on the words of men and the wisdom of men, who most of these guys are unsaved that you're reading. I would I would love for you to just pick up a Bible and for anyone listening, you know, there are a lot of people who will go to a commentary first or who will go to a, a you know, a book or a teacher or some internet guy or whatever instead of just getting into the scriptures for themselves and reading it through and through, start with the New Testament. Just read it without any outside help. Well, let me just ask you a very, sim a very simple question, Doug, and this needs to be just a very simple answer. I don't want any ridiculous explanation. Just answers. If you were to die right now, like literally if you were died right now and you were before Christ and Christ says, why should I let you into my heaven, what would your answer be? My answer would be because he knows me. Yes. And how does he know me? Because I do the works that he asked me to do. Okay, but that right there, like, if, if there were a case where God would ask that question, I would answer because I believed. And because that's what you said in your word, that whosoever believeth, Path to eternal life. Um, that uh, that your answer, because he knows me, the believing didn't didn't come in as the simple answer. The because he knows me came in as simple answers. But for you to explain your simple answer, 
you went right to yourself. Like you were relying on yourself. And that's the thing. All of us deserve hell. Dude, none of us are good enough to go to heaven. So if 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 we were relying on ourselves, we would rightfully and justfully go to hell. We deserve hell. And Doug, you do too. Everybody does. For all have sinned and come short. Every single person has sinned at least once and we all deserve it. But that's why we have to look to what he did. Like, I'm saved because I believe that what you did on the cross, Jesus Christ, was sufficient to satisfy a holy and righteous God, Will, which happens to be yourself. All glory to you. That is the true gospel. But the gospel that you're preaching is, look at me. Look at what I can do. If the gospel that you were preaching were so, then when people got to heaven, they would have reason to boast in themselves. Because it's not in Christ alone. It is in God knows me and he knows me because of my works. That is what you're relying in. And I care about, like I just mentioned tonight, but I mean, I go soul winning and I truly care about the people that I just meet every day. If, if your confession is wrong, I'm not telling you that your gospel is different and cannot say, cannot save anybody because I'm trying to be mean or rude or because it's cool to do on, on a show. No, screw all that. I, I care about you. I want you to get saved. I want you to realize that you're trusting in yourself, not in the finished work of the cross. What is finished? Now, when you do trust in the finished work of the cross, doing all these things that you're talking about is great. That's fine. But when it's after the cross, to put it before the cross makes it a work of iniquity and makes it to where these people Christ is going to say to him that he never knew them. Not that I knew you at one point, and now because you didn't keep the law, I don't know you anymore. He's going to tell him I never knew you. So in your answer that you just said, I, I hope it's clear to you that when it's because he knows you and because he knows you because of the works you do, that you're relying on yourself. Christ knows me. But he doesn't know me because of the works I do. Man knows me, knows that I love Christ because of the work I do. But God knows me because he looks at my heart, period. And once the moment, like he doesn't need me to show, I don't need to prove anything to an omniscient, omnipresent, all-powerful God. He knew from the foundations of the world if I was going to believe on him or not. He already knew that. So me proving anything to him is really just silly you know so i'll prove it to man heck i'm sitting here for hours talking to a bunch of people and uh really pouring my heart out to you right now uh, like i'll show him i i love him but he doesn't need to for to see it he already knows it he's omniscient i don't have to prove anything to him um but hopefully by our actions tonight we can prove to you that we care about what we know the gospel is and what we care about people who have been deceived into trying to rely on themselves in one way or another. Because there's only two gospels. There's one of grace, and there's one of works. All religions, even Judaism, even Muslims, even uh, the new age, seek to yourself and get nirvana. It's all works. You know, all the false Christianity, you got to be baptized. You got to be a good person. You got to go to church. You got to do this. You got to do that. It's all works. It's a, there's only, there's many, many, many religions, but there's only two gospels. One of works where you got to do something, add anything, uh, even if it's keeping your own salvation. There's one of works and there's one of grace where Christ did it all. It is finished. And that it's his faithfulness that keeps us.
Have you ever done a word study on the word grace, which is the word favor in the Old Testament? Over 270 times it's used in both Old and New Testament. And I challenge you to please seek this for yourself, whoever's listening. Every single time, every single time that word favor or grace is used because somebody did something. There is no such thing. I'm going to say it's the biggest lie that's ever been handed down by Satan's ministers in the church. There's no such thing as unmerited favor. It never existed. It's a lie. I agree, but that's Jesus is the one that merited it for us, not us. So, right, but if we're going to get grace, we have to do something. So I want to I want to make sure I'm understanding this because it's giving me a little bit of a headache. Are you suggesting that from the very channels of time with Adam and Eve, he gave a Torah, he gave an instruction in the garden, he gave an instruction to Moses, he gave an instruction to David that he loved his law, he he loved it, he did all of it, uh, he did as much as he could. It says in uh, uh, the Tanakh that it says it's not too far off for you to do. It's not too hard. And then are you saying that this Jesus is coming and he's going to do away with this law completely? That is Satan. No one said that. Oh, sure you are. You're saying that you, by definition, don't have to follow this law, which is the definition of lawlessness, by the way. It is. It is the destitute of the Mosaic law. And so if you look at, and this is very important, I don't understand why we have to be prideful about this. Let's research. Let's iron sharpen iron. In, the, in Revelation 12, 17, the definition of that word is the destitute of the Mosaic law. It's, the word is mitzvah. The word in the Hebrew. We're not, we're, not, we're not saying that the law has been done away with. By all means, if a child of God does openly sin and commits sin they're going to get chastised it's not done away with we are we are guided in our life by the law that that's how we know that we love him because the law is what what lets us know if we're going the right direction or not but what you're trying to say is that it determines salvation and that's what we are that's 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 where we're in disagreement no the law has not been done away with the law is still active and in fact if you want to be judged by the law at for eternal consequences you can still be judged by it if you'd like to be and that's what you guys are that's what you're choosing to do you want to be judged by the law and so i'm just lovingly telling you that you will be um, you'll get what you want, and it, uh, so no, we're, we're not saying that the law is done away with. We we are chastised because of it. We know when we break the law. Yeah, and you know when I stand before Christ, He's not going to see my heart or me or anything. Uh, he's going to see Christ's righteousness. He's going to see Christ's heart, His blood over me. He's going to see Christ, and that's that's what saves.